Hello, everybody. Welcome again to Elmer Fem webinar series. Uh, my name is Peter Robak, and I'm the product manager for the Elmer software. And today we'll hear about Pi Elmer. Uh, the talker is Arvet Enders Zeidlitz, and uh, he comes from the Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth. And of course, he's working with the simulation of crystal growth processes. Uh, and that's actually quite nice because the early history of Elmer is also in crystal growth. And uh, he's working with the Python interface for Elmer workflow. And uh, he's not been working for a long time yet, but uh, the results are already impressive. So I think it will be interesting to hear what Arvet has to uh, say. And uh, I think this Pi Elmer will be appreciated by the community because there are a lot of enthusiastic Python users in the community. And we also have our technical host, Mikael Kanerva, who will take care that everybody works as we hope that it will. Yes, greetings on my behalf as well uh, to this eighth uh, Elmer FM webinar. Uh, we had a few practicalities, especially for you, those of you who haven't participated before, I'll repeat what I've repeated in, in all the webinars. Uh, so for all your questions, please use the Q&A window. You'll find the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen, and we will then address them during, during the webinar. Also, if you want a speaking turn, your microphones are now turned off. If you want a speaking turn, please raise your hand. Also, there's a raise hand icon on the bottom of the screen, and we will then give you speaking turns after the presentation. Um, this will be recorded this webinar and it's going to be available on Elmer FM's YouTube channel and also the material will be available on the website. We'll post the links in the chat in just a moment. So please. So also hello from my side. Um, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Arvid Ender Seidlitz, and yeah, I'm going to show you part of my work, which is PyElma that I created to improve my workflow with Elma. Um, I was already introduced. Um, I'm a PhD student at Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth, and I worked on PyElma together with my colleague and supervisor, Kasper Stutzis who is the leader of the research group model experiment within the Nemocris project. And yeah, as already said, we are both from the Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth in Berlin, where any kind of research from the field of crystal growth is done. Um, for example, here in this picture, you see our big crystal growth laboratory where we are also working. Now, to give you an outline of my talk, um, I will start with a short motivation for the creation of Payama. Then I will tell you how to get started with it, show you some examples, and give you some background information. Um, then I will present my own application in Crystal Growth. And in the end, I will tell you how you can contribute to Payama and give a short summary. So let's start with the motivation for this. I tried to sketch this, what I here call the classical workflow with Elma that I identified to write a geofile um, for GMesh. And then you create your simulation input file and one Elma grid and Elma solver. Um, and I will explain this in a bit more detail using this heating up water case where we have, uh, yeah, this all city state where we have two boxes, one with water and on top is air and with a heating at the bottom and the cold surface at the top. It's all just heat conduction. So not that physically perfect the model, but it's good for illustration. So to start with the first step of the classical works workflow, this is the GMesh GeoScript where you have to define points, lines, and then loops from this and the surfaces, physical surfaces to export in the end your mesh. And this is already quite complex for this simple case. Um, and especially what I found annoying was this numbering that makes things 
difficult. Then when you write your simulation input file, um, this looks for my case like this. Um, what I did, my workflow was to copy everything together that I needed for my case, for example, the solver settings, and then I adapted it as far as I understood it. Um, in the end, I inserted my bodies, materials, and had to set the relations by using the IDs manually. Um, and then, of course, you need to open your shell and run Elmer Grid and the solver and try to understand all the output. Um, I wanted to improve this because it, at least as a beginner, I found is really hard to understand. Um, and I easily made some mistakes that were difficult to debug. Um, especially, I found it is quite a lot of manual work that you have to do and many IDs that confuse you. So um, for PyAlma, I wanted to um, do things a bit better or try to improve the workflow um, by following these two coding guidelines. One is this, keep it simple and stupid. Um, so everything should be in one place, um, the geometry setup and the simulation um, control and setup, and it should be easy to write and to understand. And furthermore, I really do not like copy and paste programming. That's why I have my default parameters stored separately for the solvers and the materials, and everything should be as reusable as possible. And yeah, PyAlma should be usable for beginners and experts. That's why yeah, Python is the best programming language for it. It's most popular, has a huge infrastructure and feature set. And of course, there are many more reasons to use it. And yeah, I want it for, um, for this beginners and expert to provide an open parameter space with default values for beginners and that is customizable so that also experts can do anything they want to do with Alma. To come back to the example from the beginning, I here have the code for the same case that I wrote in PyAlma. I use the Gmesh Python API, um, and then I have an object-oriented um, relation management. You don't have any ideas anymore, but you give the things names, you give your water a name, and then you have in the Alma setup your um, material for the water and all its access by names and, ID, and, and not by IDs. And yeah, in the end, you can also execute and evaluate it from your Python script. And all in all, this is 50 lines of code, which makes it a bit more simple. Okay, so now coming to the part how you get started. Um, you find everything you need either on GitHub, that's a screenshot of our GitHub page, um, or on the Python package index, which is the second website here. You can install it using pip by yeah, using this standard Python command, but you still need to have your own installation of the Elmer solver and the Elmer grid. What you can do with it, you find either in the readme on the GitHub page or on the Python package index, and there are more examples in this example folder, and you will find doc strings within the source code where the things are explained. And this is all published with a GPL license. Okay, and with this, I'd like to come to the first example, which I yeah, did not want to show live, but um, pre-recorded it. So I will just switch to the video, and this example is yeah, Pi Alma now for this heating up water case. Here you can see the code for the example that I copied from the Pi Alma GitHub page. I will go to, through this in some detail now. Um, it first starts with some import. You could just copy this if you don't understand it. Then I set up my working directory and start with the GMesh modeling. This is just some initialization that is required by the GMesh API. I'm using here the open cascade kernel that I give the name factory to not have to use this clumsy expression always. Um, I create two bodies that are just rectangles with the 
water at the bottom with the origin 0, 0, 0 and the side length of 1 and on top of it is the air body. I have to fragment these two bodies in a, a bit clumsy way here that is uh, yeah, necessary when you use the GMesh API. Um, then I create physical groups for this. I wrote my own function that is just a bit simpler and saves you some lines. You give it the dimension of your bodies. Um, this is the rectangle that we just created and the name water and the same for the air body. Um, to detect the boundaries, I also use my own function, which is this get boundaries in box. And by hovering your mouse on top of this, you can see a description of it that comes from the code in PyAlma. Um, the arguments are the minimum and maximum coordinates and the dimension and the tag of the parent entity. In this case, it's the bottom boundary that I want to detect here. It belongs to the water rectangle. Yeah, with this detected boundary, I create in the physical group and do the same for the air boundary at the top um, and create a physical group again. I set the mesh size, generate a mesh, and with this command, um, I can visualize my setup. I now run this file. Um, then you see um, here in Gmesh the domain with the two bodies, and with Control Shift V, you can select the different physical groups, water at the bottom air on top of it, the bottom boundary is here, the top boundary there. So looks like we have set up everything in a nice way. Here I have the Elma set up, we start in PyElma by creating a simulation. You could either um, say your simulation is a simulation object that you just create and then you give it some um, settings in a dictionary style where you can write anything that shall be in the settings section in your zip file but you can also directly load this simulation um, in this case a 2d steady simulation and this load function goes into the PyAlma database and looks there for a simulation named 2D Steady. In the documentation you see you can also give it your own setup file. I don't use this here, but if you have your own setup file, you can just provide the path to this JAML setup file. It has to look the same way as the file on the PyAlma website does. Um, I just show it here. It's in the PyAlma data um, and simulations where some examples are available. Here, this is the one that I'm using with a Cartesian two dimensional coordinate system, steady state, maximum 10 iterations. Okay, then I load the same way again my materials into my simulation. It's also predefined in a JAML file for air and water. The solver is also already there. I'm using this heat solver, the results output solver and creating an equation you could if your solver is not there. Again say um, solver heat equals to solver. Um, you need to give it the simulation in name, call it um, heat solver and some data. Um, this data is a dictionary and yeah, there everything, every solver parameters belong into. So again, returning to my database um, for the solvers, um, heat solver, that's what the one that I'm using, all this is into the data dictionary. But as I said, 
easiest way is to directly load the solver from the database. With the solver, we create an equation just um, consisting out of this heat solver. If you have several solvers, just add this in the list. We have an initial condition with a fixed temperature. Here I'm using the dictionary style expression. The boundaries are, uh, no, that's not the boundaries, that's the bodies, uh, a body for water, create a body object, belong to my simulation with the name water, and this is a link to the physical group water that we created with GMesh. It has a material that is water. This is the one that we defined up here in the initial condition, defined there, and an equation here, the heat equation. Same we do for air. Um, then we only have to define the boundary conditions and then we are ready to go. For this, we use the boundary class that we again have in the ELMA module. We um, add it to our simulation with the name bottom. The physical group bottom is the one that we defined here with GMesh on top. Um, and we want to set a fixed temperature. You also have different options available depending on your case. For example, um, we could also set a fixed heat flux, but this is not our case here. So I'll delete this. The same we do for the top boundary here. I just modified the code a bit to show you a different approach, which is similar to the way here. So here I'm using this um, predefined parameter fixed temperature that you, I assign a value to. But instead you can always use the data um, dictionary in this um, object. And here I would update it with the ALMA style boundary condition that shall be written into the zip file. In this case, this is useless, but if your boundary condition is not available in PyAlma, you can add any other boundary condition in this dictionary style way. Then, yeah, I write the start info and the zip file into my directory, and I'm ready to do the simulation. I just take here the execute module, module that I imported on top, um, run Alma grid in my um, directory, giving it the mesh file name um, that I exported from GMesh. Um, here it still says that you need to use the legacy, but it's not valid anymore, so you can use also the standard GMesh output. Um, then I run the solver in my di directory. It's always looking for a case.sif file. And once the um, one is completed, we scan our log files and print the output. Then we execute our script again um, and see in our sim data it creates the mesh file um, and the solver one creates a log. There's also a log for the Alma grid. Um, everything looks fine as we also see. Our function here prints the errors, the warnings, statistics. There are no errors and warnings. The statistic, it took 0.13 seconds to run this case. Um, then we can open this uh, with a Paraview. Um, we have to hit apply, select the temperature, and we see it's everything the way we expected. Hi, welcome to the... Okay, so I hope this was helpful. Um, let me go back to the presentation before we come to the second example. Um, I'd, give you, I'd like to give you some background information. Um, as I already said, PyAlma is focused on the workflow, which you saw in the video. We have the mesh generation in Python with the GMesh API, then the setup, with the PyAlma.Elma module, then the simulation one and some post-processing that you can do in different ways. 
Um, I considered for the design of IAMA to follow the structure that is defined in the SIF file. So the objects that you have in the AMA module are the same as the ones, the sections that you have in your SIF file. Um, but the keyword space is not closed, but open. So you can always add new boundary conditions for you. For example, as you saw in the example with the temperature, and I, as I uh, want to say here, if try to optimize as many things as possible so you don't have to assign IDs manually. And this workflow, um, you can see again in the structure of the PyArma package, I try to separate the things in different modules, one for the GMesh setup and the Alma module for the simulation configuration and execute module to run the Alma grid and the solver, the post module for the evaluation um, and some plotting that still could be extended. And yeah, the predefined setups that you can load and with this, I directly go into the second example, which is from Crystal Growth Simulation. And this one here. And again, I pre recorded this. So I play the video. Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on Pi Alma. In this video, I'm going to show you a an example from Crystal Growth, which is this small demo setup, um, which we use to grow tin crystals. The simulation that I'm going to show you will consist out of this crucible, which is filled with liquid tin and the crystal that is growing out of the melt. I'm going to simulate this in a steady state two dimensional case with a heating at the bottom and a cooling through heat conduction and radiation at the surface modeled by uh, heat transfer coefficient and idealized radiation. Here I already prepared the code for this case. Um, here I import different things. Um, from PyAlma I'm using um, the same stuff as in the last video and most important I import from the GMesh module um, the model shape and shape objects that helped me to set up the geometry. Here I just set up my working directory. That's where the parameters for the geometry are stored that, so that I can um, modify them easily later. Um, and here I create the model object. This model object is used on the one hand to initialize GMesh. On the other hand, it's a container that stores all geometry parameters. The geometry is in my system represented by shape objects that are yeah, created for each body. It can be anything 2D, 3D, 1D. Um, and here you see the parameters. It gets the model where the shape is added to, the dimension in name, and then the GMesh geometry IDs. And to create my crystal, which is just an, a rectangle, I use this GMesh command add rectangle um, with the origin and the size of the rectangle. Um, for the melt, it's the same. It's again just another rectangle. Um, the crucible here is a bit more uh, complicated. I have two rectangles, one is the main body, the other one the hole, and then I cut this um, hole into the main body. Um, and again, then I create a shape object. Um, I need to set the connections between the different shapes. I can just um, easily do this here by using the set interface function of the, op the shape objects crystal.set interface to melt. So crystal knows melt and melt has a connection to the crucible. That's why I here call this function again. So for the boundaries, the shape object have um, some nice functions that can um, I, that I can use to access them. For example, for the crystal, which is 
um, yeah, simple rectangle, rectangular object. I can use the um, crystal top boundary, which is yeah, just a property of the shape object and return the ID of the, the top boundary of the crystal. In my case, I need the top and right boundary and use those to create a new shape. Um, the same I do for the melt um, with the different function with the boundary in a box and for the crucible surface. Then at the interface between the crystal and the melt, I use another function. Um, I can also just access this interface directly by asking the crystal for the interface to, interface to the melt shape. Now let's have a look at this model. Here I just create the physical groups and I yeah, run this script. It looks like this, the crucible is here, the melt, and the crystal and by visualizing the different physical bodies you see the yeah the bodies and the boundaries and the interfaces that I just defined. Everything looks correct so we can continue. In this case I want to create a bit a better mesh and for this I use my uh, mesh control my mesh control classes here I set a constant mesh size in the crucible and the melt of, the, of 5 millimeters and of 0 0.25 in the crystal, which then uh, looks like this. It's okay, but I want to have a higher resolution here at the interface between the melt and the crystal, which is important in crystal growth. And that's why I can remove this, it comes later. Um, that's why. I uh, why I add here in exponential mesh control um, at this interface um, with a mesh size of zero point you know, of, of one millimeter it is and yeah exponentially increasing and it's, it is applied to the crystal to the melt and the crucible. Here I then generate a mesh, I visualize it and write it to my simulation directory. Here you see this exponential mesh size constraint. Okay, then going to the PyElma part. Um, for the Elma setup, I load my axisymmetric simulation. The materials I can load again, but um, I need to change some of the properties to stay consistent with some other assumptions that I did previously. That's why I need to update my data dictionary with a new emissivity, for example. Yeah, I, the solvers I load just again, the heat solver and the result output solver. And the equation that I'm using here, it's just one consists out of the heat equation, uh, the heat solver, sorry. Then I add my bodies with the different materials um, the boundaries with a fixed heat flux at the bottom. Um, again, a fixed heat flux at the crystal melt interface, which is the energy released by the crystallization. And that the surfaces, I said on the one hand, the fixed heat transfer coefficients um, to model the conductive cooling by the air and idealized radi radiation. Yeah, now I just run my, write my zip file, run my simulation and scan the log files, print the errors warning and statistics, which is was already done here in the previous one. And then we can look at the result. Um, so this is the temperature distribution inside our crucible, the melt and the crystal on top, which is as here the melting point. And that's just a result I expected. Thank you for watching this video. Okay, that was the second example. And now back to the presentation. Let me just switch to this laser pointer. Um, yeah, now I would like to give you some more background information regarding these two modules, the GMesh and the ALMA module. 
first um, a general thing regarding GMesh. Um, there are different ways to do this in Python. One is the native way by using the GMesh Python API directly, which I mostly use in the first example. Um, but sometimes it's, this is a bit complex. That's why I, for my application, and I hope you will also use it, created the GMesh module, which uses an object-oriented top-to-button approach. So I don't define the points, but I di directly start with the big shapes and then extract the boundaries later. And yeah, furthermore, I provide there some utility fun functions for the API, like this cut function that I used in the last example. And another way would be to use PyGMesh. You can try this, but I decided not to use it. So I found it often very helpful just to look at the PyGMesh code. You will also find this on GitHub or the Python package index. Um, now to give you some more details about the PyAlma GMesh module, um, you saw me using this in the video. This is the model class that is used to collect any kind of geometries for some global GMesh operation and to generate and export the mesh. And then the second important class is the shape. It can be a wrapper for anything that has a GMesh geometry ID. So for body surfaces, lines, or points, and it simplifies some GMesh operations, most important to extract the boundaries in the end. And then there are the classes for the mesh control. I use two of them in the example. One is this constant mesh size, and you can also set linearly increasing mesh size constraints or the exponential ones. The main working principle for all of this is that it's just a wrapper for the GMesh API, so everything is based on these API commands. But I find it a way more easy, a way easier to do it in this way than to always use the GMesh commands. And yeah, in case you have any problems using this, it's always very helpful to plot the model by first synchronizing. This is also another thing that sometimes help. And then, yeah, you just type model.show. Regarding the ALMA the module, which is used for the simulation configuration, here's some background information. You saw this um, simulation class that is used for the global settings. Um, and to store the subcomponents, so you always added um, this simulation when you defined a boundary, for example. And it is most important to, there to write the C file in the end. Furthermore, there are the classes for the subcomponents, like the solvers, equations, materials, bodies, boundaries, body forces, and so on, and the functions to load the setup. And here again, I would like to have a look at the code in some more detail, which I opened here. So this is my Alma module. This is the main structure of the package by Alma. Here is alma.py. Um, this is the documentation strings that are everywhere in the code. And when you use an ID like IDE like I do here with Visual Studio Code, um, you get the hints when you type your code. Um, this is the simulation class where you see this and parameters for everything that shall be stored inside the materials, a list of a dictionary with all the bodies, um, the constant here, just as Stefan Boltzmann, because I, you, I need this one for my own simulations. You can add another one there if you require it and the settings. Um, yeah, then the most important function is the write zip file that, um, then creates every every tag, yeah, all the text that goes in this file here first for the general settings. And then there are loops over equations, solvers, materials, and so on. And then there are the objects for the bodies, boundaries, materials. For example, for a boundary, it looks like this. Um, you first have some general properties like the ID, which is then set automatically later, name data where you can add 
any own parameters. And this is the ones that I predefined. And these are then used in the get data. This is the function that writes the stuff that goes into the zip file. For example, if say if radiation, so if radiation was set to true, then it writes uh, this text that goes into the boundary condition in the zip file. Okay, so back to the presentation. Um, now I'd like to come to my own application in crystal growth simulation. For this, I first like to give you a short motivation why you need it. Um, crystals are very important for many different applications. One of these is computer sim computers or uh, solar cells that are made from silicon single crystals look like this. And one of the main production methods for this is the Chochalski process, which takes place in such growth furnaces. And of course, it's interesting to simulate this to, on the one hand, improve the crystal quality or the yield. Um, but the, simulate, uh, the, the validation of these simulations is difficult because they are very high temperatures. For silicon, it's above 1,400 degree, degree Celsius inside this furnace, so you can't measure in there. And furthermore, there are very strict requirements on the purity. That's why in um, our project, in the NemoCRIS project, which stands for Next Generation Multiphysical Models for Crystal Growth Process, we create a model experiment which works with other materials at lower melting points. In this case, you see our setup for tin. Um, yeah, we can set different conditions with uh, another environment here. The door is open, so there's air inside, but we can close it, have a vacuum there, for example. And we can measure many different things. We have a camera here, some meters in infrared camera, different thermocouples in there, measure the electromagnetic properties and so on. And this is all used to validate the simulation. This is a short video from our experiment. So this is the crucible filled with liquid tin and we dip a seed crystal in there and then pull it upwards. This is time-lapse. The whole process is actually quite slow with several millimeters per minute. And all this, what you see here now, takes in the real world. 20 minutes. Yeah, and all this we simulate. Um, it includes quite a lot of different physics. We have the electromagnetism of the induction heating. Then we have, of course, the heat transfer from the crucible into the melt, into the crystal, the heat release at the phase boundary, and the radiation and so on on the crystal surface, and we have melt and gas flow, thermal stresses, all this needs to be considered for a complete simulation. Um, and yeah, on the one hand, we want to validate this with our model experiments. On the other hand, to implement all this in open source software. And for this, Alma is definitely the best because it provides the biggest feature set. Now, coming to my simulation, um, this is the domain that I'm considering right now in two-dimension axisymmetric, the growth furnace that you saw in the video and on the picture, the symmetry axis there on the left side, and this is the crystal growing out of the melt with the crucible, the inductor, and it's surrounded by air. Currently, I'm focusing on the heat transfer, so I'm not including any flows, but the induction heating the heat conduction, of course, and the phase change and the heat radiation. And as you saw in the video, this is a transient process when you create it, uh, when you simulate it in, uh, it, you have to consider the movement and therefore it requires a process to update the mesh. And this I try to illustrate here. So. I wrote down the loop that I'm doing with Alma and Gmesh. I start with this initial um, crystal with a steady state simulation that is then used for initialization. And then I um, go into this iterative process where I first run a normal Alma simulation where I stretch my mesh 
So this is the same triangles that just get longer. After some time, this looks really bad. I remesh, I go into this loop, create a new mesh with Gmesh, start a new Elmer, Elmer simulation where I interpolate the values from this simulation to the new one, um, stretch the crystal again, and do this until my final desired crystal length is reached. Um, regarding the setup in Elmer, this is quite complex with nine different solvers. I have 12 different bodies involved there, 25 boundary conditions that I set. I yeah, combine different simulations with the initial steady state simulation and the series of transient simulation. And all this I can do because I have PyAlma that helps me to manage this in a simple and easy to understand way. Um, yeah, and I also use Python to run parameter studies for um, investigation of the influence of my material parameters and the shapes or the mesh and convergence criteria. And this is finally the video of my simulation with the temperature shown. Um, you see the crystal growing here on the left and the mesh being replaced step by step. And this corresponds quite well to the video that you saw before from our model experiment. Okay, to sum this all up first, um, how can you contribute to PyAlma? Um, well, there are many open points in the development. For example, I really want to have some testing, but I didn't have the time to implement it yet. Um, there's, of course, always the need for more do documentation. I just added the parameters that I needed for my body's boundary conditions. So most of it is from thermal simulation, but of course there are many other applications of ALMA. So it would be good to have some predefined boundary conditions for this as well. Um, yeah, then you could add different solvers in the data directory that you saw before. Um, it would be nice to have some consistency checks directly in Python to get good and understandable error messages, for example, that explain something that explains no uses, that it's useless to run an Elmer simulation without any solvers in there. I don't have any MPI support yet um, because currently I'm just working on one core and with many simulations parallel. And yeah, in the post-processing that could be done a lot. And furthermore, there are also some, some lines that are marked with to do in the code. If you have any additional ideas, it's uh, very welcome. Yeah, and if you want to contribute, you can please um, either write an issue there that you can use to report bugs or to request other features. And if you want to write code yourself, you can create a fork and then open a pull request. Okay, to sum this all up, you saw my workflow. Um, in Python with PyAlma, with the meshing with Gmesh and the setup of Alma. I showed you some diff different examples. Yeah, I hope it's easy to use for beginners, but also flexible for any other users. And you saw my application in the quite complex crystal growth simulation. And if you'd like to support us, please cite PyAlma by using this DOI. Um, you can give us just a star on GitHub provide feedback, this is always helpful. And if you're interested in our project, you can follow us on ResearchGate. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer your questions if you have any. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was impressive both from the Python point of view and also from the Elmer simulation point of view. So very nicely done. So we have some questions here. Uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, maybe you have several questions. Would you uh, maybe want to ask him live?
Can you hear? Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had a few questions. Um, now, this was interesting. I uh, I've used uh, Elmer for my dissertation work, um, and I did a lot of external scripting and control through Octave, which is like MATLAB. Um, but it was very brute force, and it was not nearly this elegant. Um, so it was really nice to see. Uh, I have uh, just a couple questions. Um, so you said you did uh, you you did some parameter sweep um, investigations uh, for I'm guessing different geometries and heating profiles and, and feed rates. Um, does your does does PyElmer have a way of handling specifying um, say a, a range of parameters if I, you wanted to change like the width of the vat or something or the crucible um, um, and how do you handle which I, I guess that's fair that would be fairly easy to do um, you know just in, in Python using like a, a for loop or something but how how do you handle then the output files and collecting the data uh, so that they don't overwrite each other in between is it is that built into PyElmer or does that get handled manually somehow I so far handled all this manually and then, uh, so I create an external project for my crystal growth simulation that then use PyArma just for the setup. Um, it mainly works the way that I define the function in Python where all the geometry is defined. And then you can give this function different parameters like a different crystal diameter. And this is then used to create a new geometry when I have a parameter sweep. And um, yeah, I just have different directories for each diameter that I want to investigate. And then I collect all these things in Python. So there's nothing special for it that I use. Okay, yeah, that sounds similar to how I, I used to do it in the Octave where I would I would use the uh, the parameter to uh, to script the name of the output file so that each output file would be unique, and then you know, later I had to open them up manually and have separate scripts to do it. Okay. Um, yeah. The um, so the the other thing too is um, and and I guess maybe you partially answered this when you compared the diff the three different ways to work with Gmesh. Um, the the I, I I asked my first question as you were showing the first way, which uh, was I I actually. I still prefer to use the Elmer grid, the GRD file format, uh, mainly because for everything I was doing, which was simple rectangular domains and mapped meshes, um, it, it, it's, very, it, it's very easy and simple and it's, it's top down instead of bottom up. Like the first time I tried to script everything in Gmesh, I, I just got myself confused trying to keep all my points straight uh, as I was scripting. Um, so I guess that, that question was answered in that, you know, with your Pi Elmer, um, approach, you, you have more of the, the top down approach to, to, um, creating geometry, which is, which is, uh, a very nice way to, to handle it in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so that, so the, the third, the other question I had, um, you mentioned this transient remeshing scheme that you do. Is that, is that, I guess it's another question. Does Pi Elmer handle that automatically or were you doing that manually? Uh, um, I'm doing th this in my crystal growth framework. So this, I yeah didn't find so good to include in PyAlma because it's very specific, and I did not want to mess up PyAlma too much with things from my application. But we are going to publish this soon, so you then can just have a look there at our code. Okay. Um, but it's a different, uh, yeah, repository where the stuff for this is inside. Okay, I was wondering if had you tried uh, using any of Elmer's built-in um, mesh refinement schemes? Uh, I've used some of them, but uh, you know, only the uh, RGB splitting for you know triangles off mapped meshes. I, I know that there's more. Supposedly, there's more available when you use something like Gmesh to do your meshing, where it can tie in. Um, you know, within the, the CIF file uh, definitions. I, I didn't know if you had looked at any of that. Yeah, I discussed this with Peter a bit and we didn't find a, another good way to do it. That's why I decided to go back to Gmesh and to create a completely new mesh again. Okay. Yeah, I guess that was, that was why I was wondering because the, the, only, the main difficulty I've had with trying to use some of Elmer's remeshing is, is trying to figure out how to specify the 
the evaluation function for whether it should remesh and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so far I don't evaluate anything. I okay. just give a length increment and say when my crystal has grown for several millimeters, create a new mesh, and this is then used. Okay, I get, and that makes sense too, since you're in control of the the grid size, you can you can evaluate that uh, separately. So that that's good. All right. That, that, that's all my questions, except I, I did ask at the end if you could post your research gate link into the chat. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll do. Thank you. This was, uh, this was informative. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Do we have other questions? Uh, there doesn't seem to be, I, I would have a question. So uh, this last simulation that you showed, I guess it takes some time to compute. So could you give some estimate on the time step you use? Uh, on the time step, it was in the order of seconds with the growth velocity of the crystal of, um, I think, two millimeters per minute. Um, and... Mm. So the, the length increments was something in the millimeter range. And the whole simulation process um, on my laptop took a couple of hours with a mesh with 30,000 cells, I think. So I guess you have quite many time steps. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was quite a lot. I didn't investigate this further, how I can improve and what's the maximum allowable time step size. I will go into detail uh, for, yeah, which is later in my project. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, it seems that your uh, presentation was so, so convincing that we have no further questions, so. so. Okay, that's good. Yes, so I think, uh, well, uh, we thank you again, or Thomas, or do we have any questions on the chat side? Uh, let me check again, but uh, no. Uh, Maybe you have a question? Uh, no, everything has been answered for me. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> then I think I take the take the screen so the uh, just just a, was the question by Anil Kunwar answered in the Q&A okay yeah there is a question yeah so Anil maybe you want to have a opportunity to ask the question uh, online Hello. hello, hello. Do you want to ask the question online? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Arved, it is a very wonderful uh, work. And uh, also, uh, yeah, I have also uh, found that uh, interfacing uh, Elmer with Python is really a nice idea. And uh, uh, I have some uh, thoughts regarding the pre-processing softwares, uh, while GMS is, while GMS is largely popular, uh, uh, also I have found during my long uh, experiences with Elmer users that they use a variety of softwares like Salome and FreeCAD and many others. Uh, so how about uh, your vision about uh, interfacing those softwares with uh, Elmer? That is my question. And also in GMS, uh, there is already a PyGM assets where uh, it is already interfaced to Python. So that also can be directly implemented to PyAlma. Uh, these two questions, are, what do you think? Uh, first, thanks for your feedback and also for the pull request with your contribution that you made. Um, well, regarding the first 
question. I, in the beginning of my thesis, had a look at the different meshing tools and then decided to use Gmesh and don't have the time to work with the others. Um, so I just created this one way, but it would be nice if other people who prefer other software create another interfaces that you can also use with Python. So I would be happy, happy if there would be not only a pyerma.gmesh module, but also a Salome module, for example, with different examples. And if you'd like, you can add them, feel free to do this. And regarding this PyGmesh, um, it is quite close to the original GMesh API and does not offer so much abstractions. And yeah, this is why I decided not to use it in my project because when you create really complex geometries um, and want to have different mesh refinements, I found it not handy enough. And yeah, so wanted to have a different way um, with these mesh constraints, for example, that I said to have an exponentially increasing mesh size at my crystal interface around my inductor, for example. Yeah, I hope this answered it. Okay. I think there are no more questions, so I take the slides. So uh, this seminar continues still a little bit. So we have been seeing everybody here on Thursdays, and there is one more seminar to come. The material will be available if it's, it's not already available uh, here at Nikfunet FI. So this includes the slides, and then there will be the videos available at the YouTube. So you just have to remember the Elmer Femme YouTube channel, and you can browse through the videos there. And if you have any technical questions or whatever, then the forum is maybe the preferred place. If you want to discuss like collaboration or other issues, then use this Elmer ADM uh, address. And actually we are not seeing next week, we have here a, a two weeks uh, pause. So next presentation will give, be given by Roman, Roman Shevchik and, uh, and uh, his students. And, uh, it's about industrial application oriented microwave modeling in Elmer. So I think this will be also very interesting. Uh, also, if you want to have a presentation in this series, we can extend this. So if you are interested, just contact us and, uh, and we will make room for additional presentations. In July, we will have a summer vacation, but until that, we probably could include some additional slots. So with that, do, do we have some other comments? Mikhail Arved? Mm, on my behalf, no, not really. Uh, thank you to the speaker. And, and, and like I said, this was our eighth uh, webinar in the series and we have one initially left on the 13th. And uh, a continuation is apparently up for discussion. But uh, thanks to everyone. Yep. Thanks. And hope to see you in, in Elmer happenings in the future. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.